So, so we're going to do a, a sort of uh, brief amount of talking to you, and then hopefully we can engage in a discussion about this. We want to uh, answer your questions. Before I introduce the panelists, let me find out how you are. How many of you are from four-year colleges? And how many from two-year colleges? Okay, and how many from high schools? Great, okay, so a pretty good split, fantastic. I'm not sure what we'll do with that information, but it's good to know. <laughs> so let me introduce these folks. Uh, we, we, we have four major industry segments represented here, and all of these folks are from Washington State, but we're gonna do our best to take sort of a national perspective on our, uh, uh, on our industries. So moving uh, to my right, uh, your left, first is Chris Rivara, who's the uh, head of the Washington Biotechnology and Biomedical Association. WBBA. So Chris is here to represent the life sciences uh, in general. Uh, next is uh, Samson Blackwell, who's a talent acquisition manager with Providence Health. And uh, Providence Health employs about 60,000 people, uh, mostly in Washington and California. They're also the largest employer in the state of Alaska, believe it or not, and have uh, uh, organizations in Oregon as well. And Samson will talk about health care as distinct from the life sciences. All right, so the healthcare industries, n nursing, doctors, things like that. Uh, third is Gail Alverson. Uh, Gail's uh, an alum of ours and an old friend of mine. She's a senior engineering manager at Cray, the supercomputer company, which uh, unbeknownst to you perhaps has been headquartered in Seattle for a number of years through an acquisition. So uh, Gail was originally with Terra Computer Company, a sort of novel computer architecture high performance computer architecture company. So she's gonna represent information technology. Again, try to do that very broadly, including the IT producers and the IT consumers. And uh, finally, Michael Greenwood is a senior manager at the Boeing company. Uh, and Michael will uh, represent aerospace. So that's the, uh, that's the four. We've got the life sciences, healthcare, uh, information technology, and aerospace. So it covers a lot of waterfront in terms of STEM employment, and we'll just try and give you a flavor for what the growth patterns are like in these industries, what the preparation is students need, particularly coming out of high school and uh, entering college, and we'll leave time for you to direct us with your questions. So what I ask these folks to do is to begin by uh, sort of giving a general overview of their sector in maybe uh, five minutes each. So let's just go down the row and start with Chris. And the question is, what about the industry? What are the types of jobs available? What do people do? What are the skill levels for the jobs? What sorts of education are required? Uh, what are the pathways? Do people uh, enter with two-year degrees? Do they get subsequent degrees? Do they enter with four-year degrees? Uh, and what are the workforce growth prospects look like over the next 10 years? So that's a general overview of each of these four industries. Chris. Great, thanks, Ed, and well, that's loud. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So um, what I'd like to just give you a little bit of a broad overview of what we define as life sciences. I'll t then I'll bring it down a little bit to what's here in Washington State, because depending on where you're from, there's various, I would say, life sciences probably is more cluster-centric, and there's pockets around the country that are very strong or big. Um, but that doesn't mean that a student of yours may eventually go to San Francisco or Boston or Seattle or one of the other communities that, that has a very strong life science cluster. So as we like to say in life sciences, our members, our, our companies, our institutions are really focusing on healing, feeding, and fueling the world. So if you think about life sciences, what I like to say, basically the foundation is biology. Anything really, le leveraging and utilizing biology as the common denominator to develop technology or innovation to address a problem, an unmet need, is really probably going to fit into the relatively broad bucket of life sciences. Um, so let me give you kind of three kind of three broad examples. On the, on the biotechnology side, um, these companies are developing the next drug, the next vaccine, uh, the next uh, pharmaceutical that hopefully is going to help either cure or prevent cancer or Alzheimer's or diabetes or many other diseases that we're working on. Um, there's also a number of medical device uh, technologies that are also developing and being focused on many of these problems as well uh, as our diagnostics. So the other thing we're seeing in our life sciences community is 10 years ago, if you were in the biotechnology industry or you were in the medical device industry, they were very separate, separated types of industries. And what's happening today is you're seeing more and more integration um, between the devices. You're seeing a lot more devices that are, that are helping to deliver drugs. You're seeing diagnostics that are helping to identify which patient will respond to which specific types of therapeutic. Um, and I would also say the other thing kind of 
coming at, at, at it from another. You're seeing software really uh, accelerating our ability to understand the biology and the problems much more quickly. Uh, we can analyze data in huge amounts and in much shorter periods of time today compared to you know a decade ago. Um, one of our leading um, world experts, Le Dr. Leroy Hood, um, he, he's founded an organization called here in Seattle called Institute for Systems Biology. And Dr. Hood has said many times, we're going to learn more about biology and the human body and how to treat it and how to hopefully make it, you know, improve our outcomes and diseases in the next decade than compared to the previous 2,000 years. And it's really because of our ability of, so the ability of software to help accelerate that knowledge. Um, so that's kind of the healing part. The feeding part, again, same thing. We have 7 billion people in the world. The projections are that by 2050, there'll be 50 billion. And the amount of land that we can grow crops on is shrinking. So really biotechnology is one of the solutions, hopefully, to help us address the, glo the, global's need, the global need for increasing f uh, food demand. We have one of the, the best agricultural univer research universities on the other side of the state here in Washington State University. And if you look, I have, uh, normally have a data or a slide that shows that if you look at crop production, we, we show a slide with uh, the amount of uh, bushels of corn per acre grown from just 50 years ago to today. Um, the amount of, uh, of, of, of crops that you can grow in the field in the same amount of land uh, has ex accelerated exponentially. So that hopefully will continue to, to go up and that technology will be transferred around the world as well. And then when I mention fueling the world, um, obviously our dependency on foreign petroleum is a lot of challenges, uh, not only from an economic standpoint but also from a security one. And many of our members are developing uh, biofuels. And a good example, there's a company here about three, four miles away called Targeted Growth that has already developed a biofuel being made from a, a grain, a non-competitive grain called Camelina. And two years ago, it helped to fly a Boeing 747. Uh, two years ago, it also helped to, to fuel a, one of our hydroplane uh, boats during our seafare festival. And the U.S. Navy is now looking at it as an alternative fuel source for their, for their uh, jet, uh, jet airplanes as well. So that's kind of the broad sense of how we define uh, life sciences in general. And if you look at the subset, it's, it's everywhere from basic research and develop, development to translational research to commercialization, and then obviously to uh, distribution and marketing. So that's kind of the, the variety of, of uh, the, the disciplines within life sciences. The types of jobs that are available within our sector are very diverse. Uh, we need IT people, we need lawyers, uh, we need uh, marketing sales, um, we need, uh, obviously, if you look at an average biotechnology company, I would just generalize a quarter to maybe a third are, are postdoc degrees, so PhD, MD. Um, the rest of them are bachelor, uh, masters, and then a lot of uh, uh, associate degrees as well, especially the tech jobs, and we're getting more and more of our community colleges here locally to start offering certificate programs so that they can go into either our, our, uh, our manufacturing companies like our devices or our biotech companies to help uh, hire those students in, into those positions. Um, so it's a real, I would, say we, I would say the vast majority of our employees need to have at least an associate's degree. Uh, bachelor's is probably going to be, you're going to have a better chance of being, of getting employed and then obviously as you start to get more technically um, um, trained in, in, the, in the basic sciences and research, then that continues to increase your opportunities for, uh, for employment. Um, let's see, make sure, I think, I've, I think that kind of covers. So the, the prospects uh, for the next 10 years, um, we just actually had our annual meeting last Friday, and we released our economic impact report uh, for the state. And actually this last June, Battelle did a national survey if you look at from 2001 to 2010, jobs in the life sciences nationally grew about 6%. Uh, that's compared to the national other private sector jobs, which I think declined 1% or 2% nationally. What was the base? Uh, I couldn't tell you. I, I, have the I can get you the data, but I, I, that's just percent change over the same time period. Um, if you look at from 2007 to 2010, kind of the, the heart of the recession, you know, even life sciences declined about two to three percent, but the rest of the private sector declined seven or eight percent. So, as a sector within the overall employment uh, community, you know, it, it is a very strong employment sector. When we looked at our data in in Washington State, we actually just started. We looked at our baseline in 2007. Jobs in Washington State have grown 12 percent 
from January of 2007 to the end of 2011. The rest of the private sector jobs in Washington State have declined 2% during that same period of time. So I'm very bullish on life sciences, in particular in the Pacific Northwest, because of, I think, we have a very unique, almost a perfect storm here of very good, you know, one of the best research universities in the world, the University of Washington. We have some phenomenal innovation and entrepreneurs. In fact, in 2010, three of the 21 drugs that the FDA approved were, were discovered and developed here in Seattle. Uh, we have a phenomenal global health community, obviously the Bill and Melinda Gates, which also has a, a focus on helping develop technology for developing the developing nation and the rest of the world. Uh, but then also our software community, which you already have a, a great presence with Microsoft and Amazon. But Oracle and some other soft Google have established uh, a, a very sizable footprint here in focusing on life sciences. And in fact, GE and Microsoft just uh, created a, a joint venture uh, in, in Redmond uh, called Caradigm that's going to focus on the accelerating um, uh, life science and, and technology going forward. So I'm very bullish on the industry. I think it's a great, I think it's the, the, one of the industries that our country is still, if not one of the few industries left, that we really truly are still a global leader. But I also think if you're, if you're a student or you have students and you're trying to say, here's a growth industry, here's a place you can get a job in 10, 20, 30 years, I think life sciences is going to be, is going to be a good place to go for in the next decade or two. Great. Thanks. Before I turn it over to Samson, let me say a word about the, uh, the cluster notion that Chris mentioned. All right. There are a set of industries that are clustered in specific areas, and life sciences is certainly one of them. You see big concentrations in San Diego, Boston, Seattle, San Francisco, a set of other places. Uh, if you think about information, sorry, if you think about health care, right, it's everywhere. So the loqua location quotient, it's called. That is, what's your percentage of employees compared to the national average uh, uh, set of employees? There are huge variations in the life sciences, much less in the health sciences. In, uh, in information technology, the, what I'm going to call the software industry, the IT producers, the Microsofts, Googles, Amazons, those people, those are clustered, but most of the jobs are actually in IT consumers, the banks and law firms and businesses, and those are not clustered at all. They're everywhere, right? If you think about aerospace, it's clustered, but it's typical of a set of engineering and manufacturing industries that are far more broadly distributed. So I think you can draw a set of conclusions from uh, what you hear from Michael that apply to a much broader set of industries that are really distributed much more uniformly across the country. So let's turn to Samson and hear the same questions from the uh, from the healthcare point of view. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, like um, like Ed had said, the healthcare is uh, very broad based. So I'm going to give a couple of national statistics. Uh, initially, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, from t 2010 to 2020 projected that acute care, which is our hospitals, um, those kinds of providers that provide. Uh, acute care where you're admitted to a hospital, those ones uh, are going to project to grow about 26% per job. Those are healthcare specific jobs. We're talking about nursing and some of those. For clinics or ambulatory, this is an area like you go into your walk-in clinic or you have your urgent care, those are projected to grow about 35%. Uh, and then there's actually going to be a slight redu reduction projected for hospice or long-term care. So those are the health cares where you're um, for the aged. Uh, and unfortunately, those are projected to actually shrink with 5% within the next 10 years. That's your overall kind of picture that you're looking at in terms of from a healthcare specific perspective. Let me talk a broader base just of the employees that we employ within healthcare. Much like Chris said, our healthcare, of course, runs the gamut. So you've got people that you would normally expect to be in healthcare your nurses, your doctors. Um, your lab uh, folks, your imaging techs, but you've also got housekeepers, you've got, um, uh, you've got lawyers, you've got HR people, you've got, uh, you run the gamut. And we can go from, uh, some of our housekeepers require no, literally no um, diploma, to all the way up to your PhDs and your doctors who um, are at the top of the, the list. I'd say about a quarter of our employees within Providence have a higher level degree, PhD and above. And uh, about half of our uh, employees have a lower degree, ADN, MSN, or I'm sorry, BSN, or a BS degree, or a BA degree, so two or four year. And then the rest of our makeup come up to the high school degree to the ADN. For the, I'm going to give you a the more narrow segment for some of our healthcare specific jobs like RNs. What we're seeing is a, a trend um, towards requiring higher level degrees for those kinds of jobs. 
Um, the nurses are a great example. There's a program called Magnet for hospitals. It focuses specifically on RNs and their involvement in patient care. And in order for a hospital to qualify for what's called Magnet status, which is really a way of saying that we have certain levels of care that we provide at our hospitals, a certain percentage of those nurses need to have BSNs. So many of the hospitals in the area here, and actually nationally, as they move towards magnet status, are looking for BSN level nurses, not for the entry level nurse, which is an ADN. And there are also many of the hospitals which will provide programs, which will take somebody who is an ADN and help them get to a, a BSN. So they'll partner with local colleges in order to do that. Uh, you can see this kind of uh, movement towards higher level degrees across the spectrum. The next, the other one uh, that's a good example is the physical therapist, which the, a few years ago went from a master's level to a doctorate level for their, um, to uh, for their requirements. So now if you need to be a PT, you need to have your doctorate. Um, overall, the, the, one of the issues that has cropped up within healthcare specifically um, and I'm sure this is probably indicative of other industries, and um, this is where local colleges also come into play, is that having the degree is not enough. Quite often what we find is there's a big gap between experience and knowledge. And a lot of hospitals would like to hire the new grads as they come out, but they find that they don't have the ability to train those individuals to be competent on the floor within a certain amount of time. There's a lot of uh, hospitals that will do programs, uh, they call them residencies, where they will help those nurses get competent. But there are other programs which have started where those nurses are doing practicums in college and they're starting to get that experience as they move in through their program so that when they get out, they're actually competent to be able to do that level of work instead of needing the residency and that expense from the hospitals. Because as you all know, healthcare is under the dual stressors of needing to grow to serve the population, but at the same time facing budget cuts and not and figuring out how do you match those efficiencies. So for them to be able to provide some kind of education program for people who are coming out of college is, very, is a big stressor on them. It's very difficult for them to be able to find a way to justify that investment. So we've got specifically um, nursing as a good example again. If there's a big gap, we'll have nurses with about 10 years of experience and we'll have nurses who are new grads and there's a big gap between that where there's not very many nurses who have that level of experience, and so it's hard to have even what you call an informal apprenticeship to bring those nurses into practice. Uh, growing fields within healthcare, so some subsets that I had mentioned, those national average or national growth statistics we're talking about, you have um, your practitioners, your mid-levels, your nurse practitioners, your physician's assistants, and um, clinical IT is another big growth factor. That requires a couple of things. So you have people who are specifically involved in IT who need to get, um, who need to understand how it operates from a clinical perspective. In this case, you talk about employee medical records, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, um, you're talking about um, electronic medical records. Those um, are growing fields, and a lot of times you'll need somebody who also has a degree in a clinical field. So you're good at clinical IT, but maybe you also need to have an RN degree, or maybe you also need to be a doctor. So there's a number of things where you've got, you see this kind of integration of different fields as uh, healthcare grows. So Samson talked about the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, and I'll put up the URL of that on the screen in a bit, but it's, it's a gold mine of all sorts of data about projections of job growth. And look, this is a bit like a crystal ball, you know, uh, but it's the, it's the best estimates we have of national job growth. And uh, it's important to think not just about the percentage growth rate but uh, also about the size of the base and the number of degrees being granted per year, because that's, in some sense, that gap indicates the opportunity. So Gail and I think of information technology as growing like crazy, and the numbers for us are we're projected in this decade to grow by 22% uh, on a base of 3.5 million employees. So that's uh, a, a growth of 800,000 jobs, all right? If you look at healthcare, it's 26% versus 22, and it's a base of nearly 8 million compared to 3.5 million, all right? So, so we think, Gail and I think of ourselves as being pretty big, but these folks are going to grow by 2 million positions over the next, uh, in, in this decade. That's the BLS projection, okay? I, I don't have the degree date at my fingertips. 
If you think about all fields of engineering, except for computer science, it's projected to have an 11% growth rate on a base of one and a half million, so 500,000. All right, so that's mechanical, electrical, industrial, civil, chemical, you name it, okay? So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting to think about both the percentage growth and the size of the base. And healthcare, uh, even I have to admit, has a wampin' big base. <laughs> Gail, tell us about information technology. Okay, hi, can you hear me? Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm kind of deflated now because when I was reading some of the stats, I was thinking, wow, computer science is the place to be. We are just this, you know, skyrocketing industry in terms of demand, but you're almost tripling us over there over in healthcare. Woo. <laughs> um, we won't invite him next time. <laughs> yeah. We need to talk about this All ad. Right. Chris, you, Chris, you can stay Spoiler. home too. <laughs> Um, so I'm kind of born and bred a computer scientist um, and moved into some management and project management positions now. Um, but I can give you some of my perspective on it and, and some of the research that, that we've done and, and I've learned some from Ed as well. So um, IT, information technology, probably not uh, foreign to any of you. It's really pervasive in all industries. Um, it's talks about professionals who work with developing computer programs to installing them, to administering them, to supporting them, a um, broad field. Um, we've been thinking of it as kind of two broad categories of jobs. So one is those IT producers, those people who are developing the tools that then the consumers can then go use to market or, or do their development. So examples of IT producers would be your Microsofts, um, you know, developing all the Word tools. Um, the Amazons who are, uh, have, their, their tool is actually also their product, uh, a re retail business. Uh, you have the Google or the Facebook, um, Adobe. There's lots of computer industry where they're actually developing uh, the computer product that then enables others to go out there and better provide their services. Um, so it facilitates healthcare in many ways. It facilitates biotech, it facilitates Boeing. Cray does um, a lot of high-powered scientific computing that Boeing then, then leverages from. So there's the computer science field, the IT field is this really broad industry and it has kind of two buckets if you want to think of them that way. One are kind of the the foundational people developing some of the tools, and the other ones are those who are using the tools to leverage their own business. That makes sense. Um, jobs available. Oh, this is this is huge. And if you you go out there and look at um, any of the uh, the job boards, and you can type in informational technology or computer science, you just get this huge listing because there's no uniform uniform type labels for any of these. Um, software engineering is a real big one uh, where you're developing software, uh, developing um, tools that the computer understands. Um, there's test engineers where they're actually testing software that other people develop. Um, there's architects where they're trying to figure out how do you connect these computers together or network engineers where they're thinking about how do you get the most out of your network, how do you make them run the fastest. Um, there's uh, system analysts or system administrators who are helping um, set up and then monitor the systems in your workplace. Um, and oftentimes they'll end up doing some customization for the, the field that you're in, um, the, the tools that you need kind of just this, this huge breadth um, of opportunities. What, what I found at Cray, and I think is true across the board, is most of the IT jobs, um, I think studies have shown that three quarters of them actually uh, are bachelor degree to enter or, or higher. Um, there are some support type positions, um, some of the system admins, positions uh, come from a certificate program, but they are, uh, it's more like 20, 25% of the overall community of jobs. That makes sense. Um, growth prospects, again, um, 
<laughs> I, it, even though it may not be keeping up with my friend next door here, um, <laughs> it is still huge. Uh, looking at those same stats from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, if you look over the next 10 years, up from 2010 to 2020, uh, there's an 100, let's see, a million, 1.36 million jobs available in the IT industry. Um, only 20% of these are more p support positions, so that means 80% of them are really coming from coming with people with four-year four degrees or, or higher. If you look at all the other engineering fields combined and the demand for those jobs, um, the demand for the computer science jobs are twice as much as that of all other engineering jobs. So, um, again, it's, it's pretty huge. There's a report from Georgetown uh, University that kind of confirms some of that data, and it was saying that if you look at all the STEM fields, 51%, um, if you look across all the STEM subjects, areas, um, will be fulfilled by computer science. Um, and uh, you know, you know an, another report was saying that of, of the new science and engineering uh, jobs going out there, three quarters of them are going to be requesting the, the computer science information technology type background. So you know, the numbers may vary. There's lots of reports out there, but the trend is definitely that there is huge opportunity for people in this, this IT profession. Great, so before going to Michael, let me uh, show you how to get the BLS data, because it really is interesting and it's worth uh, showing to students. There's this horrible URL here, bls.gov slash EMP for employment, slash EP underscore table, that's employment projections table 104.htm, okay? And it brings you to this web page, and the useful thing here, uh-oh, the useful thing here is this other available formats, XLS. Okay, so if you click where my little fickle finger is there on the XLS, you'll get a spreadsheet. And let me show you what that spreadsheet gives you for a sec. Okay, it's this, this m marvelous spreadsheet. Again, it's a little hard to read, but there are 12 different pages. Uh, for example, employment by occupation projected for 2020, educational attainment required, all sorts of data like that. So if you go to employment by occupation, that's the, this tab, y you will see that for a bazillion different occupations, I'm scrolling down here, subcategory, sub, sub, subcategory, and stuff like that, it gives you number in 2010, projected number in 2020, um, you know, job openings due to retirements, all sorts of stuff like that. And if you look, for example, at computer and mathematical occupations, computer is uh, research scientists, analysts, software developers subdivided into three categories, database subdivided into two categories, all right? So there's a fair amount of detail and you can correlate that with educational attainment by other spreadsheets. Got it? So you go to this uh, horrible, uh-oh, the horrible URL that I showed you I can no longer find, okay, don't worry about it. And then you click the XLS, you get that spreadsheet, which is just a gold mine of data, and it's not gospel, but it's kind of the best we've got. Michael, Aerospace. All right, hi, can you hear me okay? So it's always interesting when I sit on a panel and I, I seem to learn a lot more than maybe some of the folks in the audience. Thanks, Ed, that was pretty good. <laughs> I want to talk about aerospace, uh, and, and to do that, I also have to kind of include that broader category of advanced manufacturing, right. because before you can think about assembling aerospace products, you have to conceptualize, you have to design, you have to engineer, you got a prototype, and then you can then think about how and when and if you assemble it. So it's not just aerospace as you might know it, but thinking broader around advanced manufacturing. Um, when we do that and we step away from the Boeing company and what we're familiar here in the Puget Sound and in Washington State, you think about the demand for aerospace and advanced manufacturing across the United States. Um, just in Washington, there's over a quarter of a million jobs tied to aerospace and advanced manufacturing and millions of jobs across the United States. 
today, while we sit here, there are at least three quarters of a million manufacturing and aerospace related jobs that go unfilled uh, because of a lack of uh, skilled workers. So just to kind of give you some context around how big is this uh, piece of pie or this pie that we're trying to deal with. Um, when I, when you think about that broader national look of aerospace and, and manufacturing, um, about 5% of the total jobs go unfilled today, as I mentioned earlier, but about two-thirds of all manufacturers, aerospace and related advanced manufacturing, currently have a skill shortage um, outlook. They do not know where they're going to get their workers today or into the future. Um, about half of all manufacturers in aerospace and advanced manufacturing feel like there is certainly going to be a gap five and ten years from now with the current plan. So let's talk a little bit about what kind of jobs um, are, are in this bigger piece of pie called aerospace and advanced manufacturing. So just here in Washington, just in the machinist or the production job roles within Puget Sound, there's hundreds and hundreds of different job opportunities that, that folks can uh, attain to. Anything from uh, entry level, um, factory uh, custodial type positions to advanced airframe and power plant, uh, what we call A&P field and test employees. The biggest block of production workers is in the what we call join and installation. These are all the folks that actually work inside the factories and put the airplane together. That's almost half of all the jobs in the production environment. And then if you, if you, if you go just a slight to the right and up, you have this whole group of folks that support what we call technical skills and support for engineering and for manufacturing and quality. These are the folks that do IE type work, supply chain analyst type work, um, other technical analysis uh, to support the factory operations. Um, and that's a fairly large population of job roles. Just the, the management um, pool within manufacturing and quality, non-engineering, is about 7,000 employees here in Washington State. And then when you go over to the engineering and technical side of the house, that's 25 to 30,000 employees just in Washington. So big demand, lots of different job codes and descriptions, um, all challenged with trying to find where's that future workforce going to come from. Just to give you some, some stats here at Boeing, in, in Washington we employ over 85,000 workers in Washington State. Across the nation and around the, the international enterprise, over 175,000 folks call Boeing their, their company. Um, I guess I'll back up a little bit and talk about what are the uh, educational requirements for some of these jobs. You know, 15, 20 years ago, you could theoretically get into aerospace and advanced manufacturing with less than a high school diploma, certainly a GED, but those days are really gone now. It's absolutely a requirement to have a solid GED, a high school diploma, a couple of quarters, maybe a one year of a community and technical college. But more often than not, two and four year degrees are going to become the minimum for aerospace and advanced manufacturing. Engineering, other uh, very focused areas of study, uh, advanced degrees and PhDs are becoming the norm. So I guess the message around that would be Gone are the days where you could barely get through 11 years of K through 12 and still get a good manufacturing job. Not likely the case. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about the environment, you know, the uh, kind of what it looks like in today's um, factory environment around aerospace and advanced manufacturing. But it's a, a highly complex, lean, ever-changing environment that takes highly skilled and technical workers to make it make it all tick. So I think I'll kind of stop there. Great. That was terrific from all four of you. Thanks so much. So I think, you know, if, if, uh, an analogy to this is to think about what used to happen when you brought your automobile in to be serviced to the dealer, right? And some 
greasy person would come out and look under the hood and slam things around and wiggle wires. And now someone with relatively little or no grease on their clothing comes in and jacks a computer system under the dash and reads out your last six months of data and ideally figures out what's wrong and repairs it. So all, all of these jobs in all fields are uh, kind of moving upstream in terms of the education that they uh, education that they require, and that's the business you folks are in. So let's do a quick pass down the row again and hear from each of these folks what got them into the line of work that they're in. Can we uh, just do that quickly? What was your path? Sure. So in undergrad, I probably was a fairly typical high school kid going into college. I went on a basketball scholarship, but I, w I originally was going to be an accounting major. Three weeks into my first college level accounting course, I said, not going to do this the rest of my life. <laughs> so I was a history major, a phys ed. I went around. I thought I'd go be, you know, into education. And then uh, I knew I liked science. I knew I liked math. And my advisor said, well, take one of my, I went to a small school in, in Oklahoma. He said, take one of my audiology courses. So I did. I love the applied science. So that's really where I kind of fell in love with, you know, applying actually uh, bench science to, you know, it, it, uh, into uh, human beings. So I uh, ended up getting an undergrad in business, a minor in speech pathology, went to the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, got my master's in audiology. And then once I completed that, I knew I didn't want to, I was originally in the PhD program, knew I didn't want to be a clinician, a researcher, or a teacher the rest of my life. So finished my master's, applied to business school around the country, and actually ended up uh, moving to Seattle to go to UW's uh, uh, the MBA program here. And my first job out of, um, out of, out of, my, out of grad school, I was hired by E.R. Squibb and Sons in the sales and marketing side of the industry and kind of worked my way up um, for over 20 plus years uh, in the industry side, including starting my own company that went public in July. So you, I, my advice to the kids is today is always follow what you're interested in because you never know where the careers are going to be. But if you, if you keep your mind open and you're flexible and you're opportunistic, there's, there's a great way to, to stay motivated and do something you'll love the rest of your life. I took a rather atypical path. I was actually homeschooled until my sophomore year in high school. Um, and then at that point, I went in and I experienced culture shock. <laughs> and went on, uh, spent a couple of years going in and out of a couple of two-year uh, institutions, finally completed my AA degree, went on to get my bachelor's in English um, with a minor in philosophy, and then got my master's in English from um, one of the Cal Polys down in California. And my uh, HR experience, because I've gone and moved up through HR in healthcare, uh, was kind of like an informal apprenticeship program. Started off as an admin assistant, worked my way up through staffing coordinator, recruiter, those other various fields as I was going to college. And um, I think, uh, much to Chris's point, being flexible as you're moving through, figuring out what you really enjoy um, is one of the major ways to uh, find your way into a career that's really going to be meaningful to you. And I, I don't know. As we move forward, we might find uh, everybody's had some slightly different career paths to get there. Um, but I think that the, the main goal is how do, you get, how do you move through those degree levels and then apply that knowledge? Thanks. Um, I, so I'm kind of computer science through and through. <laughs> so when I was in high school, I had this amazing math professor. And you know, at the time, I don't know how he wrangled it, but we had one computer in the school, and it was, you know, doing this really cryptic programming, APL, if anybody knows it. But he brought it into the math class, and he would work on the problems in the math class and kind of have us use it at the time. Just very inspirational. He, he kind of got, I was always excited about math. He kind of turned me into also being excited about computer science. And I don't know about you guys, if you have, as you have your students or you have kids who are in high school, but I don't know, at 17 or 18, you don't really know what you want to do or where you're going. And so, you know, I love math. I said, oh, I'm going to go to school in math. And he said, well, at least, you know, double major in computer science. And after doing a term in math and realizing, okay, theoretical math wasn't for me, and I was having so much fun in computer science, so I just um, switched to doing a full major in computer science and had fun from there. So kudos to you uh, who are educators and teachers because you can make all the difference in kind of changing the direction that your students go um, as they're growing up and trying to figure out what the best fit is for them. Um, so I did an undergrad in computer science, loved it, went to grad school at UW with Ed, did a PhD in computer science there, and then um, moved to Cray 
kind of moved around in Cray in my role, starting in kind of a research development, kind of did some management and project management, and now I'm in this really great job kind of getting to carve out the projects that I work on these days and working a lot with the legal team, actually. I'm kind of one of those engineers that aren't, aren't so scared of lawyers, which is <laughs> a little bit unusual, I guess. But it's a lot of fun. So I think that's my story. So I can kind of tell you a little bit. I've been with the, the Boeing company for over 23 years now, and I actually started there, um, I'll never forget it, in the fall of 1989. And uh, my first job was pushing a broom in the factory. And I loved it. I mean, I thought, this is where I'm going to begin, but it's not where I'm going to end. And so I made the very most of that experience. And it turns out, people that I met in the first year of my Boeing employment are still connected to me today in some way, shape, or form. So uh, it pays to, to make sure and try and do a, a good job. Currently in management, and I've had many, many different job roles at the Boeing company over those 23 years. I did complete my undergraduate, I did complete my advanced degree, and I also served in a four-year apprenticeship program um, through Boeing. But when I think back, when I think back into the K through 12 system, a couple of, of, of things really kind of struck me when I was reviewing the questions the last few days and, and thinking about how I got to where I'm at. You know, the career and technical education courses that I took in middle school and I took in high school really set a foundation for me in, in being able to, to think and use my hands and take the, the, the concepts I'd learned out of the classroom and put them to work. And I, at the time, you know, I wasn't even very good at it when I was in middle school and high school. Burned my fingers welding, all kinds of crazy <laughs> things, cut myself, but I learned. And later, when I got into the apprenticeship program at Boeing, I kind of drew on those experiences that kind of made me who I was uh, and really kind of built the foundation for my, for my career. Um, probably the second most influential um, aspect looking back, and this is, there's a message here, is that my dad really encouraged me to seek an apprenticeship. I didn't even know how to spell it. I didn't even really know what it meant, but he called it the original four-year degree. And again, while I finished my undergraduate, finished my master's degree, by far and away, I learned more in the apprenticeship program, not only about technical skills, math, science, but I learned how to work with people. And, and that you just can't get out of a textbook. Um, so really having a mentor, I think, is really what, what helped me succeed. And then the other message, since I started with a broom, I get to say this. It's okay to encourage kids to start at the bottom, right? To really learn the business. So many times, including my adult son and my adult daughter, both graduated from a four-year university. I'll never forget my son called me and said, well, I'm gonna graduate in June. I said, congratulations. He says, I'm ready to start my middle management position. And I said, well, there'll be a broom handle attached to it. And so, of course, now he's actually in an apprenticeship in a totally different industry, but he can look back now and go, yeah, Dad was right. So anyway. Uh, how seldom does that happen? <laughs> so I think this is great because what you've heard is all kinds of different paths into these industries. And uh, you know they really exist and they really work. I, I want to make a, a, a couple comments. W one is that uh, we run an event e every year in computer science at the University of Washington where we invite our new undergraduate majors to identify their most influential high school teacher. and. Uh, and we invite those teachers and their partners and the students who nominated them in for a dinner, right? And uh, the, the goal, of course, is to stroke these teachers into sending us more great students. But what's really interesting is, uh, is m many of these teachers are not from technical fields. The first year we did this, I sat at the dinner next to a French teacher. And in fact, my most influential high school teacher was my Latin teacher, right? Sounds crazy. I mean, five years of Latin never did me a whole lot of good, <laughs> except that this person uh, really sort of c c convinced me to uh, aspire to sort of what I could achieve, right? So changed my conception of myself and what I could do more than my physics teacher or my calculus teacher did. And so you, you, you see this. People come to their careers in strange ways. Uh, the second thing I want to mention, building off uh, Michael's comment about, uh, uh, about apprenticeships, is almost all of our students these days do multiple summer internships, all right? And uh, that really is where they 
synthesize what they learn in school and it's how they get their jobs. Interestingly, it creates a serious problem for startup companies recruiting our students because startup companies in IT don't typically have the wherewithal to have internship programs. So uh, the, the, the truth is last year more than half our students went to Amazon, Google, and Microsoft and we're thrilled to be a top supplier to those companies along with Stanford and MIT and Berkeley and Carnegie Mellon. But, uh, but more than half our students go to those three companies, which is not doing much for the startup ecosystem around here. And internships is the reason. The students learn so much. And, uh, and one of the things you may learn is that's not a company you want to work for, and that's valuable as well. There's always next summer, and there's always your, your career. So I think those are really important. Um, f finally, to this business of, of uh, coming to what you're interested in late and needing motivation, we run a summer program for high school teachers every summer, and we always have a, a, a career panel of recent graduates who talk to them about uh, sort of how they got to where they are. These are people a few years out, and a fellow who's participated the past few years is a guy who went from our department to work at Bungie, the games company, and he's the guy whose autograph all the teachers want, right, because their kids and the kids they teach know about Bungie. They don't really know about these other companies representing up there. But this was a kid who now uh, essentially recreationally reads mathematics because what he's doing essentially is physics simulations. That's what the, the, this part of game design is. But he had no interest in math in high school at all. He, he, it still amazes him that he got into UW's computer science program, right? And finally, when he got in the games industry, he figured out what the point of all that math and physics was, right? And now, at age 25 or 28, uh, he sort of recreationally does math and physics. It's unbelievable, and it's a great story because if you can just somehow get your foot in the door, uh, you get, or, or if through internships or uh, the sorts of hands-on stuff that Michael described, you uh, learn the motivation for these things, then suddenly you've got a whole different uh, approach to it. So let's, let's do one more thing going down the row here. I, I had two other questions for these folks. One is where are the workforce gaps, but I think we've talked a fair amount uh, about that, about the types of jobs that are available in each of these fields. And, and again, you have to look at how big is the base, what's the growth percentage, and by, by the way, the available jobs is both newly created jobs and jobs that are going to be available due to retirements, right? And then you have to look at the gap between, uh, between that job availability and degrees produced, given the educational attainment. And you can, you know, you can work all this out from the uh, BLS projections. They're, they're pretty interesting. So let's he hear instead, uh, again, if, if you're a high school student and you have this opportunity for concurrent enrollment, that is some form of uh, college in the high school, what's, what do you think is most important? And I have to say that I, I'm uh, an incredible conservative. From my point of view, it's do great in math and science and English. And uh, you know, we tell prospective computer science students that having done programming in high school is uh, honestly less important than math and science and English in terms of their preparation for uh, our program. Gail may disagree, but let's, let's go down the row here and, you know, what would you have the students focus on? So, um, it's actually fairly relevant. I have two kids. One is a sophomore at Washington State University. The other one is just starting her doctorate, also now at Washington State. She's a UW grad. Um, but we actually had these conversations. They both went uh, out of high, left high school and went to their undergrad programs with, I think, one had 20 credits, the other one 24. Uh, one was through AP, specifically, and the other one was through Running Start. So uh, we weren't aware of this concurrent enrollment, and I'm not sure if our high school offers it. They may, um, and I saw, I saw Tahoma on some of the attendees list. That's where we live. Um, but I would encourage them. I mean, I think it's a great opportunity to get exposure to, again, getting more, more depth of, um, of, of courses that hopefully they're interested in and they can make some decisions around uh, is that something that they want to pursue. Like I said, my first three weeks in college accounting, it made me realize very quickly I didn't want to become an accountant the rest of my life. And you can learn both what you want to do and what you don't want to do by the courses you take. And actually, I just had this conversation with my son a couple of weeks ago because he's kind of going, Dad, I'm not sure. And I said, look, you know, college and High school is a great time. You have to explore. You have to try to learn what's going to excite, going to excite you, and that you know something that you're going to do for a long time. And and there's going to be windy roads. Even if you get a degree in business or math or science or whatever, it may mean you go in a totally different direction later on. But I think you know follow what you really are is exciting you to go to class every day, 
and that you could envision at least having some engagement with uh, down the road as you know later in life as well. I'm going to take a little sideways jaunt from that too, and I think that um, science, math, English are all important. I think the most important part of aspect is the apply application of it. I think an applied science, an applied English, an applied giving some relevance to the classes that you're teaching. Um, I actually taught college for uh, some time at Cal Poly um, just after my graduation. One of the things I saw from the students coming in from high school was, um, and my, uh, my alma mater's thing is learn by doing. That's their, that's our motto. And we, ch we uh, strove in, in the college to teach the students, to have the students actually just do and, and to learn by actually participating in, in valuable activities that uh, they can see an outcome from. And I think that as they go through college courses in high school, the big important part of that is how does that college course differ from the high school course? What are some of the things that you can learn in that high school, in that college course that's going to prepare you in a different way than you would find in your high school course? Okay. What's, the, what's the kind of transition there? And, and how does that make a difference to the student? Um, so I'll answer that, but I was going to say on the intern route, um, just as a hiring manager, it's fabulous when you can have even a new grad. It's fine, we hire new grads, but they are a step above if they have some kind of internship experience behind them. And I think it does go hand in hand with just learning a little bit more application, working with people. Um, it's a different environment when you're in school. You can choose your friends that you do your projects with. Um, when you're in, in industry and kind of in a, in a job, you can't really make those choices. You have to just move forward with who is there and you have your deadlines and you deliver and if your buddy doesn't deliver, you still have to pull through. Um, and just kind of having that learning, that growth is, is great. And you can, you can do it through internships, you can do it through different types of classes as well. Um, but I'm, I'm a big plug for them. Um, I, I echo that um, I think it's fabulous to provide these um, advanced opportunities in high school. Uh, just my experience is that uh, in high school, a lot of kids don't really know what they want to do. Um, and if you can just get them passionate about something, at least it's a starting point for them as they're launching into their, their next step. So um, providing an opportunity, exposing them as a high school student, my advice would be to just seize that. It may not be something that you enjoy going forward, but how are you going to know when this is an opportunity to learn it in more depth? So um, I think they're, they're great programs. So I think what I'm going to say has already been said. I'll try to put a different spin on it. Um, but I would go back to the math and science challenge. Um, I work with a number of community and technical colleges in the state, and I'm certainly, this is the case at the, at the four-year universities too. Kids are struggling in that freshman year to even begin to take math and science classes at the college level. So we, we can't lose sight of that, and I just had to say that just to kind of level set. Um, today's manufacturing facility is very high tech. I mentioned that earlier. Um, this is not your great-great-grandfather's factory with smoke and lots of oil under the fingernails and back-breaking labor. Today's environment is super high-tech, very complicated, and really needs that, that, that worker of the future that thinks differently in terms of, uh, of their math and science capabilities. Um, heard it here already, um, seeking an internship or an apprenticeship, and I'll throw another one in there, an externship, really encouraging educators to please put down your your chalk and your eraser if you will from yesteryear try to try to get back into the workplace and see what's going on today because it is not it's so much different than it even was a decade ago or even certainly two decades ago um, and I want to kind of play off what we heard already the applied learning I, I can't emphasize that that enough um, it's one thing to teach kids, students, young adults, the formula for how to solve the problem. It is a whole nother learning to make it real for them. And I would argue that there is not a math or science course, certainly at the K through 12 level, maybe grades 13 and 14, that couldn't be taught completely outside of the classroom in a place like this hotel. 
There are so many opportunities in here to teach kids with the world around them, and somehow we gotta, we gotta lean back in that direction. Um, and I know this is a little bit dating me, but really having kids and students go talk to a counselor, and I know a lot of schools don't have the counselors anymore, but finding a mentor, whether it's in industry, in their family, in their school that they can go to and have this kind of dialogue and get some guidance around uh, a career path, I think is, is really important. Yeah, Chris, please. So, so just one last quick comment as a parent. Um, so having two kids graduate, going into college for 20, 24 credits, it is the most cost efficient college tuition that you can spend. You know, I think it was 50 bucks a college credit or something. I can't remember, it was some ridiculously low amount to get 20 and 24 credits. So that's the other benefit to the parents is that, you know, college is very, very expensive. And, you know, not every parent can afford it and they struggle with it. So, you know, if the kids have the potential and they can learn more about what they want to become, but also they can go and get a jump start into, uh, into their advanced degree, uh, it's also a very cost effective thing to do as well. Great. Let's hear some questions from you folks. We've got some time left. Sir. In Minnesota, where I come from, uh, and I come from northeastern Minnesota, which is Iron Range country, uh, we have a 5.6% unemployment rate in Minnesota right now. We have 5.9 statewide, 5.6 in the northeast quarter. That's because we've got manufacturing jobs taking ore out of the ground and turning it into steel, occurring in new kinds of mills, all of which require highly technical programs. We're gearing up an engineering program out of the community colleges at up on the range. We are in the desperate effort trying to catch up with the demand. The companies that are doing this are coming from India and China in order to get skilled workers. So I think there's a lot of room for talking seriously about how to upgrade our training programs so they can prepare people to do exactly what you're talking about, high tech. When you've got a guy who's running a truck whose box is as big as this room, and he's doing it all with computers. You better believe he has to be computer literate. He has to be aware of a billion systems operating at once in a way that requires a fair amount of combination of kind of mechanical feel and technical competence. So I do think there's a really strong case to be made. And I must confess, I don't think higher education has done a great job in that territory. By the way, I am happy to see at least one English major on the panel. Uh, <laughs> We are a, a difficult breed to figure out what we're going to turn out to be when we grow up, but nonetheless, it's good to know that one of us made it. <laughs> I'd say my uh, best friend from college and best friend still was an undergrad English major, and at one point he was chair of MIT's electrical engineering department. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Ed, can I make one comment? Because uh, I didn't know if we'd run out of time, but it really, I haven't heard anybody really speak to this, and I wanted to just kind of clear the air a little bit. So we've talked a lot about math and science and technical learning and, and all that stuff you got to know. There's a whole nother need in the workplace that we don't often talk about and it's on the soft skills side of the house. Um, and I'm sure that you know my generation and others we had similar challenges but there's a lack of understanding around um, the importance of good ethical choices that young people need to make and the importance of, uh, of being, um, taking initiative and being committed and being someone that they can count on, whether it's from an employer perspective, school, whatever. So I just wanted to take a moment and just make sure we at least got that out there for a, a thought consideration that while we're doing all this great stuff technically and academically, we have to also instill in our, our, our future workforce that there are expectations in the workplace and that it's not an option. So this is a critically important point. Thank you. Because the truth is that the further you are out from your degree, the less what you major in matters, right? And the more the things your mom told you were important matter. Even though you thought she was kidding, right? And uh, it, it's the ethical stuff. It's communication. 
uh, it's conflict resolution and problem solving. It's a bunch of these things that you get from any field. And the physical sciences and engineering fields certainly have no monopoly on teaching those things. In fact, perhaps to the contrary. And but what I've said is really borne out by surveys. UW and many other universities survey their graduates five, 10, 20 years out. And, uh, and they'll just tell you that, as you'd expect, what they major in matters less and less as time goes on. You had a question, please. Hi, I'm Denise Thompson. I'm a science teacher right here in Washington. And so my question is gonna be very self-serving because <laughs> I don't get a panel of Washington industry very often. So um, if you were at the keynote address this afternoon, they talked a lot about getting students in front of these careers and getting them you know, involved with people that are working in these areas. So I was wondering if each one of you could maybe talk to what opportunities there are in your fields or even in your organizations for students, you know, summer, weekend, whatever. So I'm gonna start at, at this end with not the industry view, but the University of Washington has a, a wonderful math day and an engineering day. And thousands and thousands and thousands of students get bussed in for these things. And it's a chance to get in the labs and see what it's like. And that's, that's sort of an intermediate step that I honestly think is worthwhile. The students who go to this just love it. Um, besides our organization, our website's washbio.org. Um, we have a number of uh, partners and uh, members that are doing science fairs and you know, internships and those types of things. There's another organization called Northwest Association for Biotech, Biomedical Research, NWABR, um, and it's, I think it's NWABR.org. They also just did a big science fair at the Seattle Center. That happens every year. Um, the Hutch has a big science fair, Seattle Biomed. So there's a number of organizations, and our websites, you can find all of those that have, uh, you know, high school-focused uh, programs. I'd like to say that Providence is as organized as they are, but we're not. Um, Part of our, uh, as an organization, have an injury and show up. right? Just, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll give you on-the-spot training. Um, as we consolidate as a as an organization, we went going from a bunch of independent what we call ministries um, to uh, a unified group. Part of our training and and um, uh, and other outreach is going to change, but right now it's pretty individual to the the specific hospital where that is. I can tell you the Northwest up in the Everett area, which is where I initially had had started. Uh, we have uh, outreach programs there. We'll have internships with, uh, for lab and for um, our nurse program, residencies. Uh, but there's probably a lot more that we could do around that. Uh, we also have additional times. We'll go out and we'll go to the schools uh, during their, their science fairs or during their um, open houses, and we'll talk to them about the careers that are available. And we like to have our employees go out there, the people who actually know the work and do the work, to be able to speak intelligently about what that looks like so students can ask questions. Um, we have internships as well at, at Cray, um, but they tend to be focused to college, and sometimes it's even sophomores and up, so it's a bit trickier to get into the high school. Where I think we've had the most success, um, there were two programs. Once we had, um, for several years, a uh, class come into Cray, and then we would get to show them the different types of work we do there. And that was really good, although the class size was small, um, it actually turned out to be street youth who came in and it was really, um, I think, helpful for them. Uh, what I was thinking was more along the lines, for smaller companies like us, Cray, Cray's not huge, is to tap into the employees to come into the classroom and talk with you about what they do. Because usually, um, as engineers, we're excited about our work and we're happy. To, to sit and talk about it and try and make it interesting as well. And that, I think that's what's important. Even when I've taught um, at the college, um, it was a software engineering class, having uh, guest speakers from Microsoft, from Google, um, from Amazon come into the classroom and talk about the actual work that they do was really uh, good for the students. So I think you can carry that not only at college but down to the high school, I think. So Boeing does a lot annually across the enterprise to kind of address the point that you're bringing up. Um, I know this last summer we had 1,500 engineering interns across the United States and even outside of the country involved in some uh, summer internship programs around engineering and science. Um, we're working here in Washington with the OSPI organization and developing uh, a program called uh, Manufacturing Core Plus that's gonna be launched at the skill centers here in Washington. And really what that is is a foundational learning for all students 
and then depending on where their um, skill center is located, if it's in a, a marine area or aerospace or what, what have you, they can kind of choose to focus on that part of, of manufacturing, marine versus aerospace. But your point is a good one. Um, one, of the, one of the initiatives we have this next year is that there ought to be one location where students, parents, teachers, administrators, whomever can go if they want to seek uh, an, a career choice in aerospace and advanced manufacturing. There's lots of individual sites out there that you can tap into, but you got to kind of know, and you got to know who to call and who to contact. There should be one source with a whole bunch of clicks behind it if you want to really dive into the details of, of aerospace and advanced manufacturing. So more to come. I was going to mention Microsoft does have a high school summer internship program that, that's pretty large. And for those of you in other parts of the country, there are going to, there's going to be some major employer in these fields or there's going to be some trade association who can give you pointers. So here, if you're interested in those sorts of biotech opportunities, you'd call Chris at WBBA. If you're interested in software, you'd uh, call Susan Siegel at the Washington Technology Industry Association, which is our, uh, our software association. If you're interested in aerospace and advanced manufacturing, you would somehow find your way to somebody at Boeing. And uh, you know, you've got something like that in your areas. Let's try one or two more questions. Are there any more? Please. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm at um, STEM Magnet High School in Nashville. It's a magnet of choice, which means our students come in because they're interested in either biotechnology, uh, computer science, engineering, uh, uh, interdisciplinary science, or I think that's it, isn't it, Mark? Don't get them all. And so one of the most valuable things that our students do is go into your workplace and see what you do. Because we can tell them till the cows come home what good jobs are out there. But until they actually see it, they still want to be football stars or something else. But they go in. And the first thing they say is, there are young people there, you know, working. And they can't get over that there are people just a few years because all they see is us, you know. And, and they really get excited that they can go and get jobs and get good pay. So... Please don't lose tr track of that. That's real, real important. I have to say that when the uh, students are seeking the Katie Age of uh, my kids are going to high school, I realize there's no one that's really going to understand more. <laughs> Question in the back. Yeah, I'd, I'll just tag on to that a little bit. I, I work at a large community college, and I, this is my kind of panel. I, my dad's a physicist. I grew up in Los Alamos first computer I ever heard about was a Cray that lived in the basement, one of the first ones. Uh, he got a job offer from Boeing when he finished school. I'd, and, and so you're speaking my language uh, completely. I'm in health care, but I'm an educator. Uh, so I, do you just, I, th I think we all got to go out and party together tonight. You are my kind of people. But that's kind of my point. How do we, because Einstein once said, it is a miracle that curiosity survives formal education. And, I, and it, it's funny, but it, I don't know what happens. By the time they come to me uh, in higher ed, their paths are pretty predestined at that point. Trying to get somebody who somehow lost what, I don't think it's, there's not excitement or curiosity. I think there's this fear of especially STEM type careers that starts early and, and I think, and, and I'm not pointing a finger, I think we all have to figure out a way to generate that enthusiasm and curiosity and foster that at a much younger age, or we're going to keep seeing this gap. Because uh, to me, it's fascinating. I, I, I finally grew an appreciation for English as, a, as an undergraduate. But my love was math and science. And, and it w I lived in a place where that wasn't going to get squashed. But I don't think, well, I know I didn't grow up in a normal environment. It explains a lot. <laughs> but I didn't know that growing up. And I still just, that natural curiosity and that fascination for the, the world around us, which really is math and science and engineering, and a little bit of English and humanities and liberal arts. <laughs> That's the other piece, though, though those soft skills that everybody wants in the workforce that seem to be missing. How do we package all that up? But I, but I think, again, I certainly get a lot of interest in healthcare professions, 
but I don't think it's a consequence that our four most popular health care fields also pay the four best. Uh, and they watch, uh, well, of course, I get students who come into criminal justice because they've been watching CIS. Uh, that we're not doing a very good job of, of instilling a sense of reality at an early age about what these things really are. Not that they're going to know what they want to do when they're 17, and they shouldn't. But they shouldn't have already eliminated anything with a math course in it as a possibility by the time they are young adults. And, and it's, it's painful how many of those there are out there. And it's sometimes we can turn that around and remove that fear and show them, wait, here's this great world, and, and you can do this. But remember that kids how do we do that? Yes. Right? And somehow we managed to keep that out of them. We do. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, there, there's, I think one of the great things about uh, the, the sort of um, career and technical education in high school is that you're hands on and you're doing things, right? And, yeah. and that, you know, it doesn't, it didn't matter to me that it was, that it was wood shop or metal shop or typing. It mattered that I was doing stuff. And, the, there's a lot of uh, emphasis these days on what the, the buzzword is sort of hands-on inquiry-based science. So that is back to discovering, okay, and exploring as opposed to reading. And I think, you know, we have to model that at the college level and we have to help our colleagues in high school and middle school do more of that so that kids continue to explore as they do when they are six months and one year and five years. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I really think the responsibility is us in college to uh, to try and model that uh, well, and push I, it down. Please. I think you I think you're right. And I, great comments, by the way. We own it, right? All of us own it. We do. And and I would just challenge um, the academics in the room that if you're waiting for industry to contact you, <laughs> they might be waiting for you to contact them, and you would be surprised if you get all of us in the same room together how much we have in common. But if we're waiting for the summit, right, it might be five years and we'll be right back here on a panel having this discussion again. Reach out, and if, if you don't get to the right person the first five times, keep trying. Because there are plenty of people in industry that see the problem, see the ways to solve it, but they need your help, and I think together we can do that. As a, um, I'm a psychology professor and um, from the UW Colleges in Wisconsin, I really like what you guys are saying about this oh, that application. UW. That UW, yes. <laughs> the UW. No, just kidding. <laughs> but I really like what you guys are saying, and I think I, I sit here as a professor myself thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what you're envisioning and what you guys need is very different from what a lot of us are doing. And to be honest, as much as a professor might think this is great and we should change what we're doing, until, I mean, it's going to take both. So you're saying we should reach out to you, but honestly, we need big businesses to reach out to our government and to reach out to our, de public, our departments of public instruction and to reach out to our administrators within the colleges because if you don't, um, they don't want to change and they'll get pushback even from faculty. But we really need to do what you guys are saying. We need to do it differently because exactly what that gentleman was talking about. They come to us and some of them are just tired of doing what they've been doing. And some of our high schools, I will honestly say, I think are doing a better job of getting them engaged and getting them involved. And then they come to us as academics, which I, you know, I think we do a pretty good job, but I think we've been doing a similar job for a long time and it needs to change. And it's hard to get us to change. Can I throw one last thing in about that curiosity thing? Because I think that is the core of it, right? Can you, can you encouraging that curiosity? There's a, uh, if any of you have watched TED Talks before, um, Giver Tolly is a name that you'll want to Google. It's G-E-V-E-R-T-U-L-L-E-Y. And he does a thing called Tinkering School. And it's all about encouraging the, these children to, to just explore and guiding them, but keeping a hands off and just letting them do their own thing. And the results are amazing. It's, it's pretty inspiring. Thanks. You guys have been a great audience. These folks have been great panelists. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And don't forget to fill out, a, go online and make sure you do your evaluation. All of them, if you haven't started. Thank you.